Thank you, Deanna, for those words. I think Deanna just reminded us how important community is. If you ask Bob, there's no way you can do sobriety on your own, <laughs> right? First of all, you need God, and then you need God's people. And I'm just so happy that you are all part of this, that you are playing such an important role, not just, I mean, your presence matters, right? Because you are saying you are one of us. If you don't like this culture, if you don't like what we're saying, if you don't like what we're celebrating, guess what you can do? <laughs> Go somewhere else, right? But you're here because you believe in it. You believe in people. You believe in recovery. You believe that there's hope. You believe that we're all created in the image of God, and we all are recovering to that image. Amen? So let's do some of that recovery today as we talk about Micah 4, 1, and 5. And the title is The Kingdom of God. And, and before that, the kids have their own little kingdom class that they're going to go to. It's part of the message. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Monica. The children are dismissed. The children are also welcome to stay and work, continue to worship with us. I guess I'm not perfect after all. <laughs> okay, so as we look into Micah 4, we're going to be looking at the kingdom of God because it alludes a lot to God's kingdom. When we hear Jesus teaching his disciples how to pray and the framework of our prayers and the way it's composed, one of the first things that Jesus teaches us to ask is what? Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Right? One of the first things that Jesus tells us to ask. Of course, we begin in Matthew 6, 9, and 10. And this is what he tells them. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come. We have to have, I believe, the right understanding of what this kingdom means. Because there's a lot of misconception when it comes to the kingdom of God. Your kingdom come. Jesus is not talking about a place with borders. As if you were to cross and say, oh, now I'm in the kingdom of God. Oh, no, I'm not. I'm in and I'm not. So it's not a geographical place and doesn't have any geographical notion. It speaks rather more into God's reign and God's rule and how it's manifested in this world. So you can be anywhere in this world and you can claim God's kingdom because of how you manifest God's reign through your life, through your actions. Manifested primarily, right, through God's people who have said yes. Yes to what? Who have said yes to Jesus' kingship and lordship in our lives. And who pledged loyalty to the one who gave his life for us. Galatians 2.20 says this, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live. But Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in my body I live by faith, indeed, by the faithfulness of God's Son, who loved me and gave himself for me. So you see, God's kingdom is manifested through us, God's people, who through righteous and holy living, we subvert the other kingdoms in this world. Kingdoms that often pursue selfishness, or greed, or power, or pride, or injustice, or oppression, and so forth. It's manifested through us, people who represent and who possess the good news and have every reason to be joyful. We have a, a home. 
waiting for us. We have a God who fights for us. We have a God who says he will shepherd us. We have a God who says he will forgive us. We have a God who says he will be our friend. We have a God who says you have eternal life with me. We have a God who says I stand with you. I stand for you. I stand behind you. I go before you. We have God who reminds us how unconditionally we are loved by him. We have a God who gave his life for us and so forth. So we have every reason to have joy in his kingdom because of God. Paul says of this kingdom in Romans 14, 17. So remember, God's kingdom isn't about eating food and drinking, but about righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. It's a kingdom that transcends space. It's a kingdom that transcends time. During Micah's time and the following generations who would see war after war, violence after violence, their homes plundered and kingdoms come and go, there wasn't much peace for them. Israel, who sought God's kingdom through their own kings. If you remember, God didn't want to establish kings, but the people asked for it. They said, we want a king, a human king, like everyone else. And God said, do you really know what you're asking for? And they said, yes, but I will warn you, this will happen. They will take your young men to war. They will do this, and you will be ruined by their greed at times. And they said, yes, we want a king. And so they sought to have the kingdom of God through human kings. And they often led them away from God rather than led them closer to God. Tormented by the injustices of not only foreign nations, but also by their own people, their own leaders, they now begin to ask and wonder, where is God's reign? Is God's kingdom still active? Is God still reigning? Is God still being manifested? So in the midst of that, Micah brings hope to God's people by reminding them again no matter what you see in the world, no matter what you find in the world, God never stops reigning. God never stops ruling. Nations may have temporary power here and there, but God will reign the whole world again, and it will be done with peace. So Micah 4, 1 and 4 reminds us, and it tells us, in the midst of all the doom and destruction that he's been telling us, he says, but wait, but wait. This is not all of it. We have a God who is still in control, who still reigns, who establishes his kingdom, who has a will for us and for this world. And it says, But in the days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house will be the highest of the mountains. It will be lifted above the hills, and people will stream to it. Many nations will go and say, Come, let's go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of Jacob's God so that he may teach us his ways and we may walk in God's paths. Instruction will come from Zion and the Lord's word from Jerusalem. God will judge between the nations and settle disputes of mighty nations which are far away. They will beat their swords into iron plows and their spears into pruning tools. Nation will not take up sword against nation. They will no longer learn how to make war. All will sit underneath their own grapevines, under their own fig trees. There will be no one to terrify them, for the mouth of the Lord of heavenly forces has spoken. Can you imagine that kingdom? Micah's prophetic words are filled with figurative language. And it begins with Jerusalem, a figure that was used as a central place of Israel, a place of God's activity, a place of God's presence, a place where the Holy Spirit first descended on those disciples who were in the upper room, a place where Peter gave his first sermon and hundreds and thousands of people came to Christ on that day. This place, this Jerusalem, becomes the catalyst as God's kingdom expands. And as we're reminded of Acts 1.8, right, he tells them, you will go from Jerusalem to where? Judea, and then to Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. Calls to wars and battles will cease as swords and spears used to take away life 
and now turned into plows and pruning tools to provide for life. It's so ingrained for us to fight. It's so ingrained for us to lean towards violence. It's so ingrained to us to have that rivalry. You can take any kid with their imagination where there's no toys, and you can take them to the woods or something, and they pick up two sticks, right? And as soon as they pick up two sticks, what do those two sticks become? They become swords, right? Out of all their imaginations of what those two sticks can become, they become what? Swords. And they start fighting each other, and they start thinking that they're warriors. Or my kids would say they're ninjas, right? Not because they're Asian. <laughs> it's, because, it's, because, it's because they watch the Lego Ninja, right? And so they start pretending they're ninjas and stuff. But never have I seen a kid who would pick up a sword and say, ha, huh, this is a shovel. Awesome. I'm going to pretend this is, we don't do that. Huh? Uh, even worse, a gun, right? They'll pick up a stick and they'll go pew, pew, pew. Huh? Never a broom. Never a broom. <laughs> so, but where do they learn that from? Where do they see it? It's around us. It's ingrained in us. It's in our culture. And they have no other option but to come up and say, this is fun. Let's make this stick into swords. God said there will be a day when those swords will actually become sticks to plow and to prune. And that's the peace that Micah is seeking for us, for his people. What we must point out from these words given by God to Micah is the importance of our response. And this is very important in Micah. A response to God's reign, our response to God's rule in this world. So Micah 4.2, as we read this again with Micah 4.5, it says this, Many nations will go and say, Come, let's go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of Jacob's God, so that he may teach us his ways, and we, what? May walk in God's paths. Instruction will come from Zion, and the Lord's word from Jerusalem. And then Micah 4, 5, it repeats it again. It says, each of the peoples walks in the name of their own God, but as for us, we will, what? Walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and always. The vision of God's kingdom calls for us to be involved. Calls for us to be involved. To be active participants and not just mere bystanders watching as the kingdom of God unfolds. God reminds us, true, that the main figure behind this kingdom is Christ. Christ is the one that brings this kingdom. Christ is the one that's at work in this kingdom. There's no question there. We do not cease to pray to God and ask, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But simultaneously, you have to understand, we do not cease to live righteously and justly and peacefully either. Thy kingdom come is a bold way of asking God, Lord, create in me the space in my heart for you to reign, for you to rule, and the will to carry out your mission in this world. It's futile for you to just ask your kingdom come and your will be done if you are not willing to accept what he wants to do through you. So if you're not willing to make space for God, in your heart, in your life, in your world, in your life, don't pray that kingdom come because that kingdom begins with you and how you allow God to rule in your heart, in your mind. And then that is manifested through others, right? So this peace with God, right, it begins with aligning this the establishment of God's kingdom is, is a creation of peace between God and me, but then also peace between me and others. And it begins, again, with aligning my heart to God's kingdom before trying to attempt to align other kingdoms <laughs> into God's kingdom. And it's so easy for us to just quickly observe how other people are not aligned to God's kingdom. Like, oh, that person is definitely far from the kingdom of God. But we seldom take a peek into our own hearts to see, well, how is my heart 
aligned to God's kingdom. This peace with God and with one another, these are not two separate ideas or two separate missions, but actually one that go hand in hand. Peace with God and peace with one another. It's not two separate missions. It's the same type of mutuality when Jesus also teaches in his prayer. In the same prayer, he tells us, forgive us our sins as, meaning in the same manner as we forgive who? Those who sin against that. It's not two separate missions. It's just as God has forgiven you, you forgive others. We establish peace with God and with one another when forgiveness is not withheld. Thy kingdom come. In the same type of mutuality, when Jesus teaches us the greatest commandment, he says, love your God with all your what? Heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, with all your soul, right? And in the same manner, love who? Your neighbor as yourself. Not two separate missions. It's the same one. We establish peace with God and with one another when love is not withheld. Thy kingdom come. So you see, the kingdom is not a place we go to. And I want you to get that out of your mind. Yes, God speaks about this kingdom that God, that God is going to bring to us, right? That is here, but not yet. That God speaks of there will be no more wars. Yes, but it's also in our midst. So the kingdom of God is not a place that we go to, but a place that we create with God, with the Holy Spirit. And you have the power to create that. You have the power to create, to bring that kingdom of God. And that's what the authority that God has given us. So when he says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, he's giving you that authority to create that kingdom in your world, in your life, in your family, in your community. So don't think that this kingdom is a place that you go to. Church is not the kingdom of God, right? This building is not the kingdom of God. You make up the kingdom of God because you, in this community, create a loving place where Deanna can feel loved. We create the kingdom of God with God, with the Holy Spirit. God didn't give us a kingdom where we have to earn the peace, right? He didn't say, well, if you want peace in this kingdom, well, you have to earn it. No, God gave it to us freely. And it's woven within the fabric of God's community. And we, who are similar to Israel, are in this space, yet in the middle of all these wars, of all this violence, of all this idolatry, of all the ungodliness, of all the injustice, do we still find ourselves withholding that peace from others? Or are we here to give peace unto others. Because there were many in Micah's time who did, who withheld that peace through their greed, through their injustice, through their idolatry, and many saw their own destruction because of it. But God offers us a different kingdom, one where peace reigns through our faithful walk in God's path, through our faithful walk in God's path. And as we stand in the face of this world, and what we see daily, and what often depresses us and shakes us, we still remain strong, we still remain faithful. And we hope and we pray, along with Mike and all his people, that there are those who can still confess. As Micah 4, 5 says, but as for us, we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and always. And I want us to say this together and read Micah 4, 5, together. Actually, yeah. There you go. So on the count of three. One, two, three. But as for us, we will walk in the name of the Lord, our God, forever and always. And with that mindset then, is when we are ready to ask God and pray to God this prayer that Jesus taught us. And we're going to read Matthew 6 then together. One, two, three. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In me and around me, thy kingdom come. May we be people who create that space. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for your word of hope. 
but we're thankful for the empowerment of your people. That we don't have to wait for some divine intervention, Lord, but you have placed millions upon millions of people, faithful followers of you, people who know the word, people who love the word, people who love you, who have pledged faithfulness and loyalty to you, who desire your kingdom, who desire peace, Lord God, who desire community, who desire love for one another. Father God, we know there are people, even today, who want that kingdom. And so I pray that you help us create that space, create your kingdom along with you and the help of the Holy Spirit, Father, so that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, that we may wait faithfully before you as we set our hearts to you and to follow you as we receive instructions from you and to walk on that path, Lord. I pray that you give us the strength to continue to walk faithfully in your kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.